the slower boats all uh, were in close enough contact that, that we could talk on the radio, but the larger boats didn't go through that first becoming period that we had because they were had bigger sails and could go faster, so they were further along. And uh, so we couldn't hear them, their radios. Um, were you in the middle of the last phase at that point? Or were you in the middle of the back side? Well, we didn't know, but we were being the smallest. We knew we were probably um, near the end. I think we were um, pretty much near the end. There was one boat that was behind us for sure, and I think that we were in the pod of maybe three or four or five boats of the smaller size boats. So I was able to uh, start cooking at that point. Uh, we had a wood stove, and so I had to feed wood into the stove. The stove was not in gimbals. Nowadays, the stoves are, are in gimbals, which means that they uh, swing with the motion of the boat. But my stove didn't swing, and it had two burners when I had the fire going, and it had a little tiny oven that was just the size for one pie plate. And my sink was eight inches square. Eight inches is about this big, and six inches deep. And that's, uh, that's what I had for cooking. I had a pressure cooker with me, which was very helpful. And uh, so I used that, but whenever I cooked, I'd have to hold on to the pots so they wouldn't fall off the stove. Fortunately, the mast, the Teton is a cutter rig. It has a single mast. It's in the center of the boat. That's the definition of a cutter. And uh, so the mast was right where the galley was. And so I could lean against the mast and hold on to the pot with one hand and do whatever else I needed to do with the other hand. And so that's the way I had to cook. And of course, we had no refrigeration. And so we had, uh, for the first part of the trip, we had some potatoes and onions and bacon and eggs and some apples and the orange, oranges that I mentioned. Uh, but then in addition to that, we had canned meats and canned vegetables. Um, I say there, was no, there were no frozen foods in those days. It was just probably beginning for, for a home, but we had no foods. And nowadays, it's very different. They have microwaves on board and they have microwaves all kinds of um, gadgets, but, but we didn't have any of that. So the, the highlight of the trip was um, when we got down to the end of the apples, I, I made an apple pie with a biscuit crust. And my dad, on, in this little oven that I had that was just the size of one pie plate, and my father and everybody else on that trip remembers that apple pie, the smell of it mainly, because it smelled so good. And we've been eating all this canned meat and, and uh, canned vegetables and everything. So, so that apple pie was a big hit. Um, my job, besides cooking, was to stand watch four hours. I, I stood one hour watch at the tiller. Uh, the tiller. The tiller is this piece of wood that's attached to the rudder. A lot of boats have wheels. And with a wheel, you turn the wheel in the direction that you want to go, like on a car. But our boat had a tiller hooked to the rudder. And so, yeah, when you went sailing, the rudder. Yeah, it moves the rudder. And so you push it, you push the tiller in the opposite direction that you want to go. So I had a watch on, on the tiller uh, for an hour after breakfast, and an hour after lunch, and two hours after dinner. And the other four people in the crew had five hour watches spread out uh, a little bit, except that the adult men took the night shifts. So, um, I'm not sure about Richard, the other boy that was along, but mainly my, my dad was up practically the whole time because he couldn't sleep, being responsible for everything. Now my dad, besides his watch, 
uh, was a navigator, and so he took sights of the sun with a sextant. There were no global positioning systems in those days. And uh, so he would take his sights, which he says was very difficult if it was much motion, because you have to take the sight on the horizon, so you don't want a, a bump of water in your way. And uh, so you have to get the angle of the sun uh, in your instrument to the the horizon, and then it took a lot of time without computers to uh, look through charts to figure out where you were. So he did that, and he also handled the radio, and uh, he spent a lot of time mending sails because the sails would split, especially the big spinnaker. It was our only nylon sail. The other sails were canvas, but the spinnaker was nylon. It was more lightweight, which made it nice, and it made us go faster that way, but it would split and have to be repaired every now and then. My dad also had to go up the mast several times because something would happen at the top of the mast, maybe when the spinnaker fell down or something, and so he'd have to go up on what they call a bosun's chair, just a little seat that was hooked to a halyard at the top of the mast, and somebody would haul him up. To do that, we'd have to take down the mainsail and so the boat was really rocking back and forth with no sails, keeping us steady. And um, someone would pull my dad up to the top, and he's swaying around at the top of the boat, fixing whatever was wrong at the top. This happened once in the middle of the night. I was scared to death. It was pitch black, and here was my dad at the top of the mast. We couldn't even see him up there. I couldn't see anything. And uh, it was really really frightening. At night time, when anyone left the cockpit, they had to um, hook themselves on. We didn't have life jackets, I don't believe. I mean, I'm sure they were aboard. I know they were aboard. But he rigged up a, a line uh, of a rope that went fore and aft. And at night time, we'd have to hook another line that was tied around our bodies to this one that was on the deck. And so uh, we were hooked on. Anybody who went forward had to, had to do that. Um, so he, he mended sails. Um, washing was an interesting experience. We uh, had to uh, wash our dishes and bathe and brush our teeth and everything in salt water. And so we would have to drop a bucket over the side of the boat and haul up water. Richard, the young man on board, was trying to rinse out a bowl, a mixing bowl, one day. And, and my sister warned him that he should put the bowl in backward. And he thought, oh, just a little bowl. Nothing will happen. And he stuck the bowl down facing the direction we were going, and it was immediately snatched out of his hands, and so we lost our mixing bowl. So we'd have to lower the bucket down back in first and get water up, and then I think there's a picture in that scrapbook of my sister taking a, a bath. We'd get a bucket of water, and we'd be in our bathing suits, and uh, there was one brand of soap, Drift, that would suds in salt water, and we took our baths that way, we washed our hair that way, and uh, uh, then the dishes were done the same, the same way with getting the water. We had very limited, we had fresh water, of course, to drink, uh, but uh, it's very limited on a boat that size, especially for five people. There was a, a bird that followed us from about the fifth day for about a week, an albatross. And it was reassuring. I remember that time. Every morning we'd get up and here was this bird still circling our boat. And, and I've heard just recently that uh, albatross uh, have their rookeries at Midway Island, which is north of the Hawaiian Island chain. So that bird probably was from Midway picked us up five days out and followed us a long way. And I was, I had just finished my sophomore year at uh, UCLA, and I had taken uh, anatomy. And so I decided that I was going to uh, uh, dissect 
one of the flying fish that came aboard. Every night, we would get hundreds of little tiny flying fish, not the big ones that they have in Southern California, but little tiny ones. We'd find dead flying fish on our deck. And so one of the things that I did was to get out a knife and dissect the flying fish and see how it compared to what I knew of human anatomy. Um, I've mentioned we have trouble with the spinnaker, and that was a continuing problem. Um, my, when my dad uh, went on another race after this one, uh, he went on several other races on other people's boats. He didn't take his own boat. But on one of the races, somebody fell overboard. And uh, uh, it takes about, it took them about five miles before they could get the spinnaker down. When the spinnaker's up, you can't change your direction. And so you have to lower it before you can turn around. So my dad was very nervous on this trip. He knew it would take a long time to turn around. And on this trip where somebody did fall over, uh, they had some uh, flags on buoys that were emergency things. They threw, they threw a, an orange uh, life, not a preserver, but a ring, life ring over, and one of these flags, but there was so much of a swell that the flag uh, was leaning over so much uh, that after the five miles to turn around, they were finally able to barely see the top of this flag when it bobbed. They couldn't see the life ring at all. And they did get back and they did find the man and got him on board okay. But uh, you can see how dangerous it would be out there, especially with rigged with the spinnaker going up. When we got near the islands, uh, we started getting into really tropical atmosphere. We started having tropical squalls. We didn't know what was happening at first. The sky was all clear, and we saw this beautiful rainbow in the distance. And we were admiring it. And about five minutes later, the sky turned dark, the wind came up, and the water just poured out of the sky. It just this tremendous squall, and then we had a series of squalls after this that lasted about 10 minutes, and then they'd go completely away, and there would be clear blue sky. But during those squalls, it was really hard to steer the boat. And one time, um, and this wasn't, I don't think this was during a squall, but during one of the, during this period near the end of the race, uh, the wind was picking up and blowing so strong. My sister and I couldn't stand our watches alone because we didn't have the strength to hold the tiller. And so my sister and I doubled up. So instead of standing four hours, we each had nine hour on the tiller because we doubled the two of us together to hold, hold on to it. And we couldn't ask anybody to take our place because everybody was standing watches 24 hours a day we, we were doing this and so we're, we were responsible for our slot of time. But one thing when we started getting close on the radio we could hear Hawaiian music. Here we were in all these squalls and rough weather and there was this Hawaiian ukulele playing in the, off the radio so that was sort of fun. Um, then one night at sunset the sail came down again, the spinnaker came down. This time, it got caught under the boat. It was in shreds. We could see that it was completely gone. And uh, so my dad went forward to try to help pull the sail out of the water. It was wrapped under the keel and around the rudder. It was a mess. And when he went forward out onto the bowsprit, he saw a light. And the light was the lighthouse uh, on Molokai, and it was exactly where he was navigating to, where we were aiming for this whole 2,500 miles. He hit it right dead on, and we were so excited. Everybody was up all night. We uh, had to change our course at that time because we had to be off Molokai to get through the channel between Molokai and Oahu. And the next morning at sunrise, we had our first uh, view of Oahu, and we saw Makapu'u Point, and then a little bit later we saw Diamond Head, which was going to be our finish line. 
So we quickly changed back into our uniforms, which were these um, shirts, the striped blue and 